Thank you. Um, a lot of stuff is changing. I'll, I'll, I'll start with that. Um, it has been a very busy two weeks uh, since we came back from break. Um, and there's a, a lot of uh, things to look at, a lot of good data to look at. Um, 25 slides tonight that I'm going to move through uh, rather quick. And I start with that because I'm going to sum it up um, in, a, in just a couple sentences. Um, one is, um, yes, we are experiencing a surge. Um, we continue to monitor the surge. We continue to put safe practices into play. We continue to um, uh, emphasize um, what we know to be working. Testing, masking, all that uh, um, uh, Swiss cheese kind of modeling. Um, we know that works and we're gonna continue to focus on that. Um, we are committed uh, to keeping our schools open. Uh, that is from, from the highest point in our nation uh, all the way down. Um, I am convinced that all of our employees know how important it is uh, for our schools to be open and our, our kids to be at school. Um, and then uh, just a commitment to following guidance. Um, it has been a um, very busy week. I think we were, we all knew kind of a surge was coming. We anticipated Omicron could be um, uh, bad. Um, I think there's there's the good parts and the not so good parts, right? I don't think um, we it ended up being as as um, deadly um, as it, it could have been, but we know that it, it it is more contagious, right? So that has put um, differing strains. Um, and I'll go ahead and just jump in in from here. So a little bit about the data and the strain. Um, at least a week ago when I was putting this together, we were averaging. Um, uh, 386,000 cases per day in the U.S. Um, hospital rates were growing, but they were at a much slower rate. Um, the death rate um, is falling. Um, at least it hasn't, it is nothing compared to what uh, previous strains have had. Um, and the hope is that Omicron's uh, going to peak mid-January to late January is what we're saying. Um, in the superintendent's calls this week, um, and the elected official calls um, and all the calls, uh, the message has been January is going to be tough. By the end of January, we're going to start to see some changes. And hopefully by the end of February, uh, things are going to be normalizing a little bit more. In terms of our local data, uh, looking at the rate of spread, the RF number was 1.55. Uh, so summing that up for about every two people, um, and they pass it on to three people. So it's, it's spreading at a little bit higher rate than one for one. Um, the vaccination rate in our county is incredibly high, 91.8% uh, as of last night when I looked it up for five plus. Uh, when I look at, we look at um, uh, Belmont particularly, uh, just our location, um, it's 97.8%. Uh, for the shores, I can't disaggregate that part of Redwood City, but one would think uh, we're neck and neck. We're, we're, we're the same community, right? So uh, those vaccination rates um, are really good. Um, and that is one way that we're going to help weather the storm. Uh, so differences from uh, previous uh, vac uh, surges, the rates of vaccination, we people are vaccinated. Um, the Omicron illness is generally less severe. It's not to say that there's not severe cases out there, but generally speaking, our hospitals are open um, and our community is open. Our kids are in school. There's social events. There's community. There's not as many um, community restrictions as when we were forced to shut down um, in March of 2020. Um, and then, and then generally speaking, we we have good mitigation factors at this point. We're observing masking protocols. Um, we are limiting the number of visitors that we have on campus during the pandemic. Um, we will revisit um, our visitor uh, protocol at the end of January. I can already say likely we will make an update to the vaccination status to ask for that boosted um, element is, is one of the recommendations. Uh, we'll follow testing protocols. Um, you know, initially nobody... Uh, probably realize the importance of testing 
Um, and one thing that we did is we kept all doors open, uh, really. We applied for each program. We got worksite labs. We got um, uh, state uh, resources. We got uh, the pool testing resources and the antigen that came with that. So we really have multiple venues um, at hand uh, to take care of our needs. And we've been successful in doing that. And we always encourage our staff, keep your doors and windows open because we know that um, the fresh air um, makes it all that much better. Hence why are all of our doors and windows are open today. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, sure. You know, the idea of going to one without a coat on, yeah. <laughs> why are you? Anyway, how we go from um, a pandemic to endemic, um, I share this because a pandemic is an epidemic of kind of mass proportions. Um, and and the, um, in epidemiology, an infection is said to be an endemic in a population where that infection is, is constantly maintained. So more like the flu. Right, so we are somewhere on that continuum, um, hopefully moving to that endemic status um, so that we are living with um, and adapting to um, more easily. So case rates, and I'm, I'm gonna cheat here, so I'm gonna look at mine. Uh, we're just tracking them. Uh, really, uh, these charts are designed to show trends. They're designed to be transparent as possible. Um, this, this data just looks a little different than it is on their website. I pulled from our website and I just translated it in different ways. And I will say, as I evolve these charts, I have did different cuts in different places so people know. But um, before break, eight cases a week, three cases a week. And then we hit the first week of winter break. There was only one case. Um, okay. Uh, second week of break, we had 37 cases. So we started to see what all the socialization and the holiday spirit um, started to translate in terms of cases. And that is when Omicron uh, started to really um, kind of roar, if you will. Um, I, I will point out that we know that we had one case in 37 cases because we were reporting them over the holiday. Julie was collecting data over the holiday. Our folks were monitoring. Um, what was taking place, and we were doing our due diligence. Uh, Post-winter break, first week back, 165 cases, um, uh, more than we've ever seen, clearly. Um, I put uh, in parentheses 100 by Wednesday um, because I took yesterday's totals and I wanted to compare them to today. Um, thus far on, uh, on Wednesday, last Wednesday, uh, January 12th, 79. So 179, I'm not gonna say it's going down, but that data point suggests that maybe um, we're starting to see um, some shift. Taking a look at countywide data, again, uh, driving home the point, I know this is really hard to see. Um, the chart on the left side is the number of cases over the entire pandemic. The chart on the right, is the number of deaths over the entire pandemic, right? So two things, and I, I don't know if this has a, uh, there we go. Um, that was that last big surge we had uh, last year. And during that last big surge last year, it translated into this huge peak um, of deaths countywide. Um, morbid, yes, um, but, when we look at the peak that we're experiencing now, much higher than the peak was back then, and um, the rates of hospitalization and death um, are, it's not picking it up over there, um, are much, much lower. So when you look at the county site, they're actually tracking a lot of zeros too over time. Um, again, uh, it is impacting people, but it is impacting people in different ways. Um, and we're um, learning how to cope with the illness in our community. Um, uh, Trustee Koo alluded to or shared Dr. Morrow's um, uh, thoughts on, on an elected official's call today. Um, and he was pretty honest. He said January is going to be bleak. 
He said there's going to be a number of cases um, that, yes, Omicron is uh, very transmissible, um, and we're going to see um, spread in our communities. Um, but he also said um, that we have to maintain per, uh, perspectives. Cases are off the charts, but look at our hospitals. Look at the, the number of deaths in our community. Uh, they're um, relatively low compared to what we've seen. Um, our hospitals are stressed, but they're not necessarily stressed from COVID patients. They're dealing with staffing issues as well, um, other, other procedures, other, other um, cases, um, but it's not because of COVID that our hospitals are um, uh, being pushed. Um, I will say that it's important, I think, to read more into all the media that's out there um, about why hospitals are, are, are pushed, like get past the headline and read the rest. Um, same thing with schools. Um, schools aren't going into distance learning. Um, they're closing or looking at modified instruction so that they can get past uh, staffing issues, generally speaking. Uh, so um, the other thing I'll just say is anecdotally, uh, we have worksite labs um, on our campuses. Um, we do get um, their reports um, and we're able to um, look at trends. Uh, during the um, last couple of weeks, we've definitely seen increased testing um, and we've seen increased positivity rate um, through worksite labs. The number of, uh, the percentage of tests that were coming back positive um, peaked actually um, mid last week based on the data we had um, and has started to decline and, and potentially plateau. So again, um, I don't know what's gonna happen, where it's gonna go. Um, I don't have that crystal ball, but there could be signs that we're um, seeing the transition and seeing um, things um, get better sooner rather than later. Uh, I also say the best part with Dr. Morrow, um, he, he started pretty bleak, but he ended on a high. He said, well, we will get through this. Um, and he says, I know we will because we're doing things right. Um, and that's really the um, biggest piece uh, that they can say. Vaccination, if you're vaccinated, you're 20 times less likely to be hospitalized um, than if you are not vaccinated. If you are boosted, you are even more less likely uh, to be hospitalized. So again, uh, that's why we're pushing vaccination clinics. That's why we want to offer those resources to our community. Um, for those who, who want that and make that choice for their family. Um, case reporting, I think you've, you've heard it from our staff through a number of different things. Uh, we, we continue to report cases. We continue to be transparent. Um, there may, uh, full, tra full transparency, there may be elements even in this deck that are changing um, as we speak. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll talk about some of those changes as we go. But uh, case reporting, we still work with county health. Uh, county health is um, overwhelmed with contact tracing and whatnot. The guidance is continuing to evolve. So uh, the one thing that we saw this week, um, actually we saw uh, this is a little bit of a story. So uh, last week we, we started, um, actually CDC, I think it was over break, uh, started to adjust um, isolation periods for positives to go down to five days with the test. You can come back into normal life at day six. Um, that happened at the CDC. The CDC said, this is our guidance. CDPH said, oh, okay, that, that guidance is looking good. We accept that guidance for the general public. Um, and it didn't translate for a lot of um, our communities that we work with, that now CDP, CDPH has guidance, but they have guidance not only for the general public, they have guidance for schools. And typically they're lagging, right? They, they wanna, CDC translates to adults, CDPH can translate to adults, but when it comes to, to schools and kids and institutions, um, they reevaluate it and, and do things at a little different pace. Um, I will say that we're starting the guidance um, is starting to come together. 
Um, uh, I can't give a lot more details uh, than that. I, I'll give a few more, but uh, guidance was released last night. Uh, it was shared at the elected uh, meeting uh, today. It was shared with superintendents uh, shortly after that. Um, and we are making sense of that. But um, uh, generally speaking, we're going to be we're going to see uh, shortened uh, quarantine times. We're going to see I uh, get to, get to this in a little bit. We're going to see um, uh, notifications probably with close contacts uh, be streamlined. Um, likely close contact is going to be defined as if you're sharing the air um, in a space. So typically, if a student is a, in a classroom right now, they're sharing the air with those uh, 25 or 30 kids. We will define those as all close contacts. Whereas you heard from our principals, uh, we were actually looking at seating charts. We were going by the six feet, 15 minutes or more guidance um, and, and tailoring it for that. So let's talk about learning. Okay? I said from the, from the top down, the president, uh, we know our kids can be safe when in school. That's why I, he said this, uh, believe that schools should remain open. Governor Newsom, as we approach the new year, we reaffirm our shared commitment to one another, to our parents and to our students, to keep each other safe and to keep our classrooms open. To Superintendent McGee, uh, just the other day, educational leaders are 100% committed to keeping students in school. And I will say, uh, uh, she was sharing that and she was quoted on that and um, she, in her superintendent's meeting, she said, this is what I said, guys. And all of us said, absolutely. That is our goal, keeping our kids in school. That's where they need to be. So um, uh, I think that's different than what we saw last year, right? Um, we actually had public health tell us, no, at one point your schools had to close, right? And then that started kind of that whole ball. So um, we are, are united, I think, from the top um, down um, about keeping our schools open and the importance. So why aren't we closing schools? Just for clarity, um, in March 2020, like two years ago, um, at the start of the pandemic, uh, we had no knowledge of COVID-19. We had no safety protocols in place. Uh, we had a deadly initial surge. We had healthcare systems that were overwhelmed. We had little access to PPE. Um, no one was vaccinated. Clearly, January 2022 is very different, right? We know that students need access to in-person learning. We know the social emotional toll that the pandemic has taken on our youth not being in school. Uh, we know they need access to, to caring adults. Um, Mr. Pappas, um, uh, I think made that clear, right? How important the school is as a community. Uh, we need meaningful engagement. Um, and in schools, we have uh, safety protocols. We now have testing. Um, and the broad uh, proportion of our staff are not only fully vaccinated, but boosted, um, which is important. And, and, and students continue to, to be vaccinated as well. So this piece is more of a clarification. Um, so there's, there's um, you know, the, the idea of things continuing to evolve and guidance continuing to evolve. We now have testing. That's <laughs> okay. Uh, the, uh, guidance continues to evolve is a great thing, right? It means we're following the science. It means we're adjusting. It means um, we're getting better at what we do. Um, the downside of, of things evolving is some th sometimes things change, things get confusing. Um, we um, are, wait, are we operating under this or are we operating under that? And um, we are in the midst of that shift and that negative side of uh, evolution, I think right now, as we're, we're trying to make sure everything's clear. So uh, I got a lot of questions like, hey, in our, in our um, reopening guide, we say that there's, there's specific criteria for when our schools are gonna close. And we've had to have hit that by now. Why aren't our schools closing? And um, it's actually a pretty, pretty straightforward. We've always said and followed when public health says we need to close, 
we will close. And it was their criteria that was established that we adopted. Um, their criteria has continued to evolve um, and uh, their focus is really on um, is spread happening um, and is spread happening at a different rate than it's happening outside of the community, right? Like, is there a reason why we should do something different in this environment? And if not, if it's being maintained, if it's being mitigated, no, keep our schools open. So um, when we uh, do our next update, once the pandemic recovery framework has been updated, we'll make sure that we uh, update that um, and it'll uh, probably be pretty general. Uh, continue to follow um, San Mateo Public Health um, guidance for closure. Um, and I will say, I don't, I, I don't believe that we're going to get there. We're learning how to adapt. So again, I was talking about Evolve. Um, so yesterday, uh, CDPH said yesterday that they would release updated guidance soon, like literally those words. Um, uh, they'll align quarantine guidance, general quarantine guidance, um, there will be adjustments to contact tracing and notices for students. Um, and CDPH hopes that those transitions will help us be quicker and our response um, be quicker. Because the thinking is, if we can tell parents even quicker than when we, um, than it takes to go from person to person, perhaps that, that um, can have a positive impact. And, and quite frankly, it is, it is draining uh, to administrative staff. Um, the number of hours that are going into those notices. Um, so, and then they said uh, the pandemic recovery framework, they, they had an update, but they were going to delay it until the new guidance. So, um, I highlighted yesterday and I highlighted soon because soon came today, actually late last night. So, again, um, we are working through this. Um, I'll just, you know, kind of point out my, my flow chart has things crossed out as we're. Um, um, adjusting, uh, we're going to continue to adjust, make sense of the new guidance, and we'll we'll update families as we can. Um, it's all on CBPH website, but there's so many nuances and so many overlaps um, that we do all need to make sense of it. Um, again, we're looking at CDPH guidance for general public. We're looking at CDPH guidance for schools, and we're looking at Cal OSHA guidance for employees. Um, each one of those um, has different nuances that interact with the other in different ways. So, but uh, biggest piece is uh, quarantine is going to shift to um, uh, fewer days, um, the option to test out um, in fewer days. Uh, contact tracing is going to evolve to rather than everybody who's within six feet. If I'm sharing the air with you, we in this room would all be close contacts today even though I'm, I'm 10 feet away from, from Kirsten, okay? Uh, question comes up, uh, what are we gonna do um, uh, if uh, we experience staffing shortages, um, if um, we're not able um, to staff? Does that um, uh, mean that we have to close? Uh, we will be as creative as we can. Uh, in terms of staffing. Staffing is probably the biggest threat uh, um, to us in terms of success, um, but we have a lot of creative options um, open to us. Uh, we have our subs, we have um, uh, the ability to, to shift um, personnel. Um, we've covered, uh, I haven't covered, I'm looking at Ching Pei has covered classes. Um, we've um, been custodians and testers um, here at the district office too. Um, there's a lot of flexibility that we can do to, to make ends meet. Um, I share the analogy, some, a parent shared, but my child watched Kung Fu Panda um, in PE today. Yes, that, no doubt that that happened, um, but it was staff connecting so that we could prioritize kids being at school, kids connecting with adults, kids getting their core academics. Um, and, and sometimes we might have to make those adjustments. Um, if it comes to the place where we had a staffing shortage and we needed to look for other options, 
um, we could look at short-term independent study, um, which would allow um, kind of a Zoom environment for a short period of time, 10 days or less, so that we get by with that shortage. Um, how might we use that? Um, we, we, again, would be creative. Um, we know from Omicron that sometimes um, people um, are sick, but they're not, right? They tested positive and they have no idea how they tested positive and they feel fine. So might we be creative to find ways that actually allow that teacher to Zoom in the class when, when we have um, another staff member that can provide supervision? So we will absolutely look at those, those things before um, we um, ever went into kind of a long-term independent study. Again, I think as you heard from Mike, um, uh, we made amends meet and things seem to be improving. So uh, uh, I won't say it's, it's perfect, but um, uh, we're very hopeful um, as we look forward. Um, I always want to just point out, like the other reason we're not that that we're not uh, talking about distance learning is there's no provision for distance learning. There is no piece in the Ed Code that allows for distance learning. Uh, distance learning was allowed under SB 98. It expired in June of 2021. Um, that model is is no longer so. Um, uh, the, the question is, can't we go back to distance learning just for a few weeks until the surge? No, it's not allowable by, by education code. Uh, the other piece that, that, uh, um, that uh, did come into play at the beginning of the year, as you recall, was independent, uh, different independent, short-term independent study. This is long-term independent study, um, where students actually are um, really, they're enrolled in our district, they're, but they're in a completely different program that is very, very independent. Uh, the daily synchronous check-in um, happens, and I say it's brief. Um, in TK3, there's a daily check-in. Um, in uh, middle school, grades four through eight, they consider um, it's a weekly um, check-in. We try and do more, our, our, our um, provider tries to do more, but it's, it's mostly in the form of office hours. Um, so there is, um, uh, it, it is very independent, right? Um, and we have a very small number of families that are participating in that independent study program. So I'm going to go through the last few slides pretty quick because they're my reminders. Home symptom screening. We know if your kids are sick, please don't send them home. Or send them to school. Keep them at home, right? If we are able to do our screening, we prevent uh, the disease from getting in our schools. Uh, masking guidance, another one. This was, this was that, that trickle-down effect, right? CDC said KN95s, N95s, surgical masks are better. We're recommending them. California Department of Public Health uh, said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Yes, we're going to incorporate that into our general guidance. Um, Masking guidance for schools at this point in time remains unchanged. Um, there's ways that we can um, make our masks more effective. Um, I actually just sent this, this just came out yesterday uh, from uh, San Mateo uh, County office. Um, and I sent it out to all of our families because there's little things, um, you know, being well fitted, making sure that it's up on the nose and, and pinched and um, sealed. Um, regardless of the mask type. If it's not worn properly, it's not doing you any good. Swiss cheese model, I won't say any more than that. Um, stay at home and get tested. We have lots of uh, testing. If you're uh, sick, it's time to get a test. Go and get the test. Um, I will say uh, the other thing is um, we have antigen tests. Uh, we, we had a, a few more than we had students initially. Um, we have our supply of in, internal testing. Um, so we have the resources to get kids back in school. Um, that should not be a barrier for any of our families uh, for returning to school. Uh, they need to contact their site, contact the district office, and we will make sure that they have a test that either we perform 
um, or they take home and do it themselves. Uh, but right now that should not be a barrier to returning um, to school. We are not just giving them out because people want them. Uh, there needs to be a need um, and we need to make sure that our supply uh, remains stocked. Vaccination events, please, please, please. If you're listening to this and you haven't signed up and you're not vaccinated, uh, it's a great time. Uh, the links aren't live here, but they're on, on our website live. Um, and then I'm gonna, I, it was funny that we both picked up a piece from Dr. Morrow about um, mirror neurons. And mirror neurons um, are brain cells that enable a child uh, to learn by observing others instead of having to practice every skill firsthand. Uh, mirror neurons support the child's ability to empathize uh, with the person that they are observing. Um, it makes these brain cells, uh, it's these brain cells that make uh, parental modeling of positive and respectful behavior uh, so powerful. Um, and, and, and Dr. Morrow said, you know, he said, when you're watching a movie, maybe this resonated with me because I'm a guy, um, but he said, you're watching a movie and, and they start crying and then all of a sudden you start crying. He said, it's not necessarily because you're emotional. It's because your, your mirror neurons are empathizing with what you see and it's your way of reflecting um, your empathy. And I noticed because Ching Pei and I spent a good portion of our day at Sandpiper the other day uh, doing antigen tests. And our kids are incredibly curious about antigen tests. Um, they they wanted to know what was going on, and, and and they were stressed. Like, did somebody test? Did somebody? I'm like, it's okay. Deep breath. And I said, I said, what what are you guys stressed about? And and they said, I don't want to test positive. I don't want you to test positive either. But um, what's stressing you out? And, and some of them were, were really cute. I want to make sure I can see my grandma and grandpa this weekend, right? I want to make sure that I can go to my sports game. And others um, were like, I don't want to be sick. I'm really scared, right? So I, I share that because this resonated and, and I think it's the adults, how we moderate our behavior around our kids. Um, it's how us as colleagues moderate our behavior um, around each other. Uh, so that we always remain um, proactive um, instead of reactive. So if you're a parent listening, uh, don't forget that your child is um, hearing what you're saying to your spouse or partner. Uh, they're picking up uh, the news that's on in the background. Um, it, it's important that we're talking to our kids about um, uh, what's going on in our community. So um, with that, I think that's it. Questions, comments, uh, all those good pieces. But just know the guidance is coming. Um, as people have questions, um, reach out. Um, but right now we are sorting through things. Uh, we are gonna be updating folks. I'll probably tomorrow we'll send out um, links that come directly from CDPH. Um, it won't be a little while till things get translated onto a chart that looks um, pretty, although a lot of people say, I don't like this. I just like the bullets. Um, and um, I just have huge props to my colleagues too, because, um, you know, as, as this week, as Julie was contact tracing, she was developing lists of names that um, went uh, uh, to Ching Pei uh, to make sure that she actually followed up with families and say, hey, it's it's your day five, you can come back now because guidance just changed. Do you need a test? We wanna get you here. Um, to her staff meeting with parents and opening doors and, and getting those tests. Uh, to um, Rui helping us with all these back end kind of analytics that help Mike know um, if they're out this day, they can come back this day. Um, we're really trying to put in systems in the place so that it makes it easier for everybody. Because um, those systems really don't exist. So.